Hi, welcome back. This module deals with the early challenges after transplantation. In this lecture, you will learn about ischemia reperfusion injury and how this relates to innate immunity. At the end of this lecture, you will understand how these early events can have a long-term consequence for graft survival. During the transplantation period, it is inevitable that the kidney is devoid of oxygen and nutrients. This process is called hypoxia or ischemia. Three phases can be recognized, which will impact the extent of ischemia reperfusion injury, or IRI. First, the history of the donor organ will have an impact on pre-existing injury and the reserve capacity how to respond to an insult. Kidneys from a living donor will suffer less from IRI compared to the brain death or circulatory death donors, as presented in Module 2. Second, the conditions and period of storage will impact the amount of injury, hence explaining the negative effects of long cold storage times. This underlines the need to keep cold storage times as short as possible and the importance of research trying to improve storage conditions. And finally, several injury mechanisms are induced at the moment that the organ is perfused again. For instance, the generation of reactive oxygen species and exposure to several plasma proteins will injure the kidney. Functionally, this will result in delayed graft function. As a consequence of the specific vasculature of the kidney, the corticomedullary junction, so the border between cortex and medulla, already has a low oxygen tension. Therefore, it's this location where the initial and strongest injury is observed. Histologically, the process is characterized by ATN, or acute tubulous necrosis. A specific patient case with DGF will be presented later in the module. The pathophysiology of IRI is very complex and is characterized amongst others by vascular injury and vascular leakage, induction of cell death programs, induction of several inflammatory genes and cytokine production, coagulation and complement activation. It is good to realize that these mechanisms are not unique for transplantation, but are also important in other conditions of ischemia, like myocardial infarction or in stroke. Although a detailed description of the complement system is outside the scope of this lecture, I will give you a simplified overview here. The complement system can be activated through three different pathways, the classical, lectin and alternative pathway. Via these routes, both pathogen structures as well as antibodies recognizing foreign structures can activate C3 and C5, which are the central components of the complement system. There are three functional consequences. Inflammation through the anaphylatoxins C3A and C5A, opsonization for phagocytosis through C3B, and lysis of the target cell through the C5B9 or membrane attack complex. Whereas the complement system is very important as part of our innate immunity against infections, it is also activated by injured or altered self, or by antibodies recognizing antigens on human cells. This includes antibodies directed against HLA. Therefore, complement is also increasingly important for diagnosis and possible treatment of antibody-mediated rejection a subject which will be further discussed in the lecture of Dr. Hyde. An important clinical observation is that the amount of IRI not only has a direct impact on the renal function, but also has a long-term negative impact on graft survival and is associated with more acute rejection. How can we explain this? A paradigm for nowadays immunology is illustrated by this famous Leiden Bridge. Although often dealt with separately, it is clear that the communication, the bridge, between innate and adaptive immunity is of critical importance. Therefore, we have to look again at basic principles of the immune system and make a comparison how it responds to infections. In Module 1, it was already introduced that the innate immunity has a humoral and a cellular part. Professional APC, like dendritic cells, are essential to activate T-cells. Upon infection, pathogen structures called PAMPs or pathogen-associated molecular patterns 
activate the immune system via toll-like receptors expressed on APC. Well known are the effects of the bacterial product LPS on TLA4, a discovery awarded with the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2011. Apart from pathogens, also ischemic or injured cells can release so-called danger molecules or DEMPs, and they will activate the immune system in a similar manner. As mentioned, exposure of the DC to DEMPs or PEMPs has important functional consequences, often referred to as DC maturations. The cells start to express higher levels of MHC molecules, both class 1 and class 2, higher levels of co-stimulatory molecules, such as CD80 and CD86, and produce higher levels of cytokines. All these effects are important for a stronger T-cell activation. This will be further expanded in the lecture on rejection, and some of these molecules are also a target for therapy, as shown in the visualization. So, in summary, in this lecture we've learned that IRI negatively affects the immediate function after transplantation, and that it is dependent of factors before, during, and immediately after transplantation. We saw that the pathophysiology of IRI is complex and involves complement activation. Moreover, that IRI will generate danger signals, or DEMPs, which will activate the adaptive immune system. And finally, as a consequence, IRI has a negative impact on the long-term graft survival.